get up, I die a little. Can't barely stand on my feet. Take a look at yourself. Look yeah. in the mirror and cry. And cry. Oh, what you doing yeah, to me? Yeah. I spent all my years believing you. I just can't get yeah. away. Introducing the all-new Ridgeline, the only truck with an available truck bed on. All right, you can let it play it all the way. That's all right. We're selling Honda Ridgelines today. Did you guys know that? All right, good deal. You're wondering what's going on, and I'm obviously not pastor, and so you know, too, what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it like that, if you don't mind, because it makes it a lot easier for me. And my OCD kicks in, and it makes it a lot simpler. So welcome this morning. I'm glad you're here. Did you enjoy that? Sheep are pretty amazing animals, huh? Who knew that when you weren't around, they could do all of that and harmonize just like that, right? Randy, you need to find some sheep, man. It's unbelievable, okay? Add them to the crew. Novelty. Guess what? You fill the whole place up here, man, because uh, everybody will be excited about it. They'll wonder what in the world's going on. And so, uh, but uh, what a cool thing. Sheep are awesome. In fact, today, uh, I'm going to be talking about sheep a little bit. Uh, that's why we, we played that, that clip for you, because uh, sheep are awesome. And uh, uh, actually, the title of what I want to speak to you today on is No Ordinary Life. By the way, my name is Pastor Ken, in case you're, you're new here, and, uh, uh, and uh, I'm really excited to be here. Normally, I'm across the, uh, the way, and I am uh, with some of the most important people on the planet. Uh, there. I'm with the Future Church, and I have an opportunity to do that. Hey, did you have that picture that I, that I put up for you, that I gave to you early, that I sent to you in an email? Is that there? I'm sorry. There's one that's, there you go. Hey, I just want to say uh, uh, happy anniversary to my wife today. <laughs> 34 years. I had a lot more hair back then. She still looks the same, except for she doesn't smile like that, I can just tell you. She has her own smile. I think that was that photograph smile where they said, smile. <laughs> we had already smiled for so many pictures back then that we weren't sure exactly how we looked and how we smiled. In fact, when we came through that, that day, which was an awesome day, uh, uh, that was kind of the culmination of, uh, I was 13 years old when I first met her. And I loved her from the beginning, and she hated me. She just did not like me. Uh, as a pastor, I understand how that feels, <laughs> okay? I know how that looks sometimes. Sometimes people were not right with you. But you know what? Uh, she, uh, she, finally, I chased her down so far, so long, so relentless that she finally started dating me. And, uh, and man... Uh, what a what a cool what a cool ride it's been. Thirty four years and uh, three kids. Two are married. Uh, one granddaughter who has been with us since Friday uh, evening, and uh, her mom and dad have been away for a, a wedding, and uh, uh, she didn't sleep but about two hours, about every two hours last night. So it's been an inter interesting evening. Uh, I remember those days as a parent. That's why I love being a grandparent, okay? Because <laughs> at, at times you get to send them home, not last night. And so this morning when I got up, finally got back up, she was up, and we'd kind of been in and out. Uh, she said, oh, Papa's here. And so she made my heart, she made me smile. And so uh, what a cool, what a cool ride. So. But today I want to talk about no ordinary life. In fact, it might be titled, Wonder, 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 No Ordinary Life. That's what I want to, want to talk to you about a little bit uh, this morning, just for the next few minutes. And uh, I was thinking, uh, one of my favorite all-time uh, uh, moments in movies with sheep is from Evan Almighty. I want you to take a look at this, guys. Take a look at it right there. And uh, it's one of my favorite ones, if it's coming. Come in there at some point. Maybe. Nah, I want Evan back to build a line. Oh, yeah. Hey, Dad, look, Chico. Well, today must be my 
my lucky day. Now, no matter where he turns, those animals are following me. See if you had a mark, you can have a place to put them on. No All right. All right, sheep are amazing. You didn't know sheep could get in your car and just show up and do all kinds of things. In fact, sheep are amazing. In fact, if you have your Bible today, if you'll turn to Psalms uh, 23, and uh, there, that would be awesome, man, if you would do that this morning. In fact, I'm going to read it first in the NIV, and then I'm going to come back to it in a different version, because, I, and I'll tell you why. In the NIV, it says this. It's a Psalm of David. It says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not, I shall, I, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his, his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to pray right now. Can we do that, Lord? I just thank you for being in this room today. Lord, we, I thank you, first of all, because when you're here, there is a promise that something will happen. Just because I speak doesn't mean something will happen. Just because I study doesn't mean something will happen. But because you're, you promise to be here, where there's just two or three gathered in your name, something's going to happen. And I thank you for that, Lord. Reach into our hearts today and help us. Whether we're on the front side of this journey following you or whether we've been following you for a long time, Lord, help us, God, to be right where you want us to be. Thank you for your help this morning, Holy Spirit, in this, in this in a few minutes, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. That means just so be it. That means so be it. In fact, you know what? The Bible calls... God's people, his sheep, right? You guys know that, right? That's kind of like Bible 101. He calls uh, his people, God's people are called uh, his sheep. In fact, uh, it's, a, it's amazing that uh, there's so many scriptures about sheep, the sheep, shepherd, shepherding and all that, following and listening and all kinds of things. And so I'm going to talk about it a little bit today, but just a couple of scriptures in uh, Ezekiel 34, 31. He says, you are my sheep, the sheep are my pasture, and I am your God, declares the sovereign Lord. Not any Lord, not some king, but the sovereign Lord says that you are, you, you and I, we're, we're his people. Psalms 95, 7 says, for he is our God, we are his people, the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if you would hear his voice, don't harden your heart. In fact, I remember writing down last week I was, we were here for a family service, and uh, thank you, parents, for worshiping God together with your kids. There are not many churches that you can go to today in America where that you can actually stand side by side with your kids, lift your hands, and they get to see you worship God. Or they get to see you go to the altar. They get to see you uh, uh, practice your faith uh, in, in a corporate setting. So thank you for that. But in that service, Pastor talked about the disciples and how that the disciples... We're in the boat, and they were hardened. Their hearts were hardened, right? He didn't say they were hardened by sin. He said they were gospel hardened. They had heard all of this. They had seen the miracles. They had heard the message. They had seen Jesus. And yet in the boat, when the storm came, all they knew what to do was go back to what they knew. <laughs> they were rowing like crazy, man. In fact, I think Pastor said it was like eight and a half or nine hours they rowed until finally they said, Hey, man, we're going to die. And you know what? I think that's what pastor equated with a hard heart. They had a hardened heart. They had heard it so long. They had heard enough of it that they were asleep. They were numb to what God was doing and what he could do. And just when they thought they'd figured it out, they really hadn't figured it out. Anybody know what, anybody know what that feels like? Come on. Let me see your hands if you do. I know what that feels like. And so... The disciples, man, we, we know that they needed, they needed help, and Jesus came to their, their side. You know, there's a picture. You have my picture, man. There's a picture there of what a lot of times people think of when we, when we talk about sheep. This is a really, really hard image to, to wrap your head around if you're an American. 
Because we Americans, man, we don't want to be fenced in. We don't want to be hemmed in. We don't want someone watching out for us. We don't want someone enforcing. In fact, and when I found it, saw this picture, it's a small corral. We know that. But you know what? We, it, there's, the, there's the shepherd, and he's got his watchful eye. He's intently watching just in case they do something wrong. And then he has his guard dog there, and, man, he's at the ready, ready to nip at your heels, ready to nip at their heels, man, just in case they move the wrong direction. He's going to herd them. He's going to, and that image of sheep, is something that we really struggle with as Americans in the American church. Man, we don't want to be considered, we don't want to be weak. We're Americans. We can do anything. Listen, I've been in and out of this country a bunch of times, and I loved it. I, I, I love this place, man. There is no place on the planet like this. I'm just telling you. And, I, and listen, we're a multicultural church today. We have multi-ethnic. We have people from all over, and I love your story. I would love, I'll I tell you what would love, I would love to do, I would love to go visit every country that every one of my dear, my, my, my dear people are from. I would love to go see it through your eyes because, man, it would, it, would, it would give me an opportunity to experience your story. That's awesome. But I'm going to tell you something. My story is here in this country. Standing in Moscow back in 1991, uh, 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 a week to the day after the coup on Gorbachev. Uh, the barriers were still up that you saw on CNN and all that. I'm flying, we're flying into the country with some graduate mission students. And you know what? In Moscow, 9 million people at that time. Beautiful place. But we went to a grocery store to get some food for our trip. And when we did, we had to wait in line to see if there was food in the grocery store. I've never experienced that. I'm 55, and I've never experienced that in my lifetime. Some of you may have, but I've never experienced that here. In fact, when we came back, when we stayed in Moscow, right there, right across from Red Square, when we called the uh, hotel, uh, the restaurant, the hotel, and said, hey, we had to call because we had to find out if they had enough food for us to come and eat there. This is a great country, you hear me? This is a great place. This is an awesome, this is an awesome place. And you know what? Because of that, you know, we feel like we can do anything, and I believe we can, because I think God gave us a capacity that's pretty incredible. Human beings, a capacity to do amazing things. But at some point, there's a surrender that comes in our life. And, you know, when you think about this picture, uh, and sometimes even the picture of, a, of, of sheep is kind of that sheep are dumb. do de do de do right? Wandering around, do de do de do okay. This is awesome. Okay, what am I doing over here? I don't know. Oh, look, Daisy. Ah. Oh, this is good. All right, I like it. We, we don't like that image either. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about it because I'm not sure that's exactly how God sees that today. So no ordinary life, wander. First thing I want you to look at with me is sheep do wander. W-A-N-D-E-R. Sheep do wander. In fact, in Isaiah 53, 6, and 1 Peter 2, 25, the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all gone our ways. Now, many of us, man, there in the church, we look at that as we say, yes, those people out in the world, they've gone their own way. But that is absolutely not accurate translation of this scripture. We all have gone our own way. How many of you, understand, how many of you believe that today? Left to our own devices and our own time and our own thinking, we will invariably wander. We'll wander. We'll wander away. We'll wander, we'll wander away from God. We'll wander. We'll do all kinds of things. In fact, in fact, I love the, 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 the story of the 99, uh, the one in the 99, the good the parable of the shepherd, man, in Matthew 18, 12 through 14, and Luke 15. Uh, three, three. They bring everybody in, they get into the fold, and when they get into the fold, what happens? When they get into the fold, there's one sheep missing, right? And when that sheep is missing, what happens? The shepherd leaves the 99 and goes to find that one lost sheep. He leaves the one. It's 
that parable is, is a series of three parables. In fact, in that parable, it's, it's in those three, one of them gives a feminine expression to that, to God looking for us. Isn't that kind of weird? Now, I'm not saying God is feminine. How many here I just said? I, I, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, is that it, the, the parable of the lost coin where the lady is looking for the lost coin. In order to understand God looking and searching, it is so much bigger than what we've ever imagined, I think. But sheep do wonder. They wonder, man. Sheep wonder. When they get a chance, they wonder. In fact, when, the, when that shepherd went to find the, the, the lost lamb, he still cared about the 99, but the one he couldn't get off his mind. I want you to see a real-world uh, experience with a shepherd. Can you show that to them today, guys? A real-world experience of a shepherd calling his sheep, if you can, if you got it there. There we go. Son. You have to turn it up a little bit. There you go. Is everyone done? Run your senior out. She asked him. Does the shepherd want to say anything? The sh the sh he said, she asked him, she said, does the shepherd want to say anything? And he said, yes. The sheep know the shepherd's voice. And the shepherd knows their voice. When he was pointing out the, the one standing that were running off to the edge, he said, see that, see that one there? She doesn't understand yet. See, she was doing her own thing. 
But did you notice that when she wandered, she took some other sheep with her? Did you notice that? You see, sheep wonder. Sheep do wonder. They do. In fact, after almost 34, uh, 33 years of being in ministry in Greenville, it's one of the things that I can never get used to here. I've never been able to get used to it. I ask my guy, the guys that are in my, my cohort, uh, my masters, which will finish up in August. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I'm in two classes right now. Uh, and uh, it, it's an interesting thing. It'll stretch you. Stretch you. It's like Play-Doh. You get stretched, squashed, cut up, put back together, stretched, squashed, rolled out, flattened. I mean, and then all of a sudden you build from the, from the ground up. But you know what? There, there's a lot of wandering that goes on. In fact, there's a lot of wandering in the, in, in outside the kingdom, but also in the kingdom. In fact, in fact, I love the scripture, though, from this guy. It says in John 10, 27, it says, He knows the voice of every person. He knows the shepherd knows, uh, sheep know the shepherd's voice, and he knows who they, he knows them. In fact, I would, I would take it a step further, and I would say that he knows the voice of every person today, even the wanderer. The wanderer in the Christian faith, and the wanderer outside of the faith as well. You see, God is our creator. He knows everything about us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, I love it. Luke's gospel really presents that whole universal universality of, of the, the invitation of Jesus as the way to salvation. And I don't mean that by, hey, everybody's going to be saved. That's not going to happen. How many heard I just said? That's not going to happen. But the invitation is for everyone. Kind of reminds me of when people ask questions about why would, a, why would a good God, why would a loving God send anyone to hell? The real question, though, that's the wrong way to, that's the wrong question. The real question is, is why would people reject a loving God in the first place? Why would they reject a loving God? And you know what? It's our, our, our opportunity as believers to show that God actually loves people. He actually does love everybody. He loves the ones that are in the social, the heated, most heated social controversies of the day. He loves those people. He loves, he loves them, man. He wishes nothing more than to reach out to them and to change their life. No ordinary life for them. No ordinary life for us. But we're prone to wonder. In fact, that's what the, uh, one, of the one of the writers of of uh, I, th I guess it's come thou found. I guess is what it is. That that uh, come thou found of every blessing. There's a verse in there, verse six. It says, "Prone to wonder." He says, uh, "We're we're prone to wonder." Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for Thy courts above. In fact, we're prone to wonder. How do I know that? In Genesis, when God said, "Do everything. You got everything. I give you everything. You are you are more than blessed." with the garden and all the things, but that one thing right there you can't have, and what do they do? Hmm. Prone to wonder. All I have to do is ask any parent in this place, any parent of a small child, when they're a baby, oh, we love that baby smell. Woo, that baby smell. Mm. Man, that baby smells something else. It's like having a puppy, isn't it? It's a puppy smell. Adeline and I, we watch puppies. We found a... Uh, I stream most of my stuff at my house, and we found a live webcam of puppies. That's crazy, isn't it? We loved it, man. They were awesome. They were they were rolling over, and they, they didn't know where they were at, and they were trying to crawl on top of each other, and it was a crazy thing. But that puppy smell. But when they're when they're brand new, man, they just can't do anything wrong. But at the earliest possible moment of their life, what do they do? I often tell the kids in kids church. I often tell them. Hey, you know, you're riding in a buggy with your mom. You were just a little one. Did she try to have you snapped in? And she said, Mommy, you said, be careful. Stay right here. Don't get up. Oh, you're trying to stand up. You know, don't stand up. Mommy said, don't stand up. Boom, there you are. She reaches over to get some cereal. She's reading the label, and you wiggle out of that thing, and you stand up. Right? You see, we're prone to wonder. At the earliest moment in life, we're prone to wonder. 
We're prone to wander. Sheep do wander. They do. They, we're prone to wander. And so you know what? We see it in Genesis. It happens. It happened all the way through. I love that the Bible is not about perfect people. It's about imperfect people like me. I have an opportunity to serve the king of all kings because he left those examples there for us so that I could say, oh, wow, there's hope for me then. How many of you feel that this morning? You know, we're prone to wonder, and we do wonder, and I want to move that past this too long on this one. Definition of wandering is walk or move in a leisurely or casual or aimless way. We can, we can wander in body today. We can physically leave. People do it all the time. People leave, come and go. People leave. People do all kinds of things. People do. I can tell you as a pastor, it's the hardest thing for me to deal with, especially when you give someone your heart and then you never get to say goodbye. You know, it's, I, 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 and I don't understand it because I didn't lose a child in a war that never came back home. So I don't want to ever indicate that. But I would say, I would say that for me, not being able to say goodbye and have closure, it's the thing that wakes me up at night at times. And I have to say, Lord, help me because I can't, I'm not responsible for that. I didn't make that choice, but it breaks my heart. And I think that when we wander, it breaks God's heart, whether we're in the fold or outside. We can, we can wander in our mind. Mental distractions. Man, we got them. It's not hard to be distracted today. In fact, this morning, I have resourced more people uh, than I normally would on any Sunday morning. I've turned on all the lights in, uh, in kids' church. I have uh, turned on all the vid. I loaded everything. Everything was ready to go. I then loaded up all of the material that they're teaching in uh, the Able Island, man, for them to be able to display as they're studying Russia today. Uh, also help people make copies. <laughs> also loading things. It was a crazy day. The f my phone has been going off all day, my text. How many of you know it's easy to wander in your mind? You can be sitting in here and, and you're communicating with somebody right next to you. It's easy to wander. It's easy to fill your head. Or like me, who, uh, uh, or like me in school, it's easy to fill your head with the, with the ideas of people and be so filled up that you have to go, man, I, I can't even try to focus on anything because my head is so full of stuff. Right? It's easy to wander in your mind. It's easy to wander uh, in your spirit, the spiritually lost are people who have been hurt and who began to search in alternative places. But you know what? This shepherd, he, he's not willing that one be lost. In fact, the sheep do wonder, but there is a good shepherd. There's a good shepherd. I want you to remember that. We know we wonder, but there's a good shepherd. And so I want to remind you today, no matter where you are, we wonder but there's a good shepherd. He cares about you. He doesn't want, he doesn't wish that anyone would be lost. As the psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd. I will want for nothing. There's no ordinary life that for you in the shepherd's care. No ordinary life. The second thing is sheep will wonder. You just said that. No, W-O-N-D-E-R. The sheep will wonder. In fact, the sheep will wonder, but there is a good shepherd. There's a good shepherd. You see, questions are okay with God. How many of you know I grew up in, in the church? I've been in church since I was uh, about two weeks old. Uh, my folks didn't have a lot of sense, right? They brought me to church. Terrible, man. I've been in church all these years. But it's okay to ask questions. There have been times in my life that it was, doesn't feel like to me it was okay to ask a question. That if I asked the wrong question in the wrong place, somebody would smack me down and say, what, you, you, you've lost your faith? What's wrong with you? We don't question that. But I'm going to tell you something. I serve a God so big, he is not concerned. He's not taken back by any question you pose to him today. You hear me? And so you know what? Sheep will. They'll wonder. Questions are okay. God's not challenged. In fact, I love the first question, one of the first questions uh, in the Bible. 
in Genesis 3. I, I love it. When, when God steps down in the garden, and what does he do? Adam, where are you? Hmm. God set a precedent there. It's okay for you, if you're here today, to say, God, where are you? Where are you, God? It's okay. You're not going to hurt his feelings. In fact, you know what? When you ask a question about God, when you ask a question, those questions, man, really promote discovery. They promote growth in your life. I love Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. It says, it says this, it's talking about him as a high priest, but I think it's applicable here. He is touched with the feelings of our weaknesses. Therefore, we can approach him. We can approach the throne of grace. In other words, we can come and ask a question. We can come. He knows our weaknesses. He knows where we live today. He knows when we had that bad moment. We all have them. You hear me? We all have them today. We all have moments where we go, oh, I wish I could have not said that. Oh, I wish I hadn't have done that. Oh, I wish I hadn't have set that in motion. And we can come to him and say, Lord, I have this question today, and I'm not sure about what to do. You see, when you have questions, I want to encourage you today, there's a good shepherd. There's a good shepherd. He is, he's listening to you. Not only do we know his voice, if you're in the fold, if you've invited him into your life, but he knows your voice today. He's not going to throw out a mass email to you. When you say, oh God, I don't know what to do. My mom and dad are about to split up. Oh, my children, I am watching over all of you. And if thou art dealing with hmm, rejection, uh, uh, hmm, uh, loneliness, uh, uh, maybe uh, eating disorders, uh, oh, he's not going to send that out to you. He's going to say, hey, hey, man, I hear you, and I'm right here with you. And I'm going to be anything that you lack. I will even be a father to the fatherless. You see, God knows where you are. He knows who you are. And I love it, man, because questions promote discovery. The rich young ruler, there's a lot of great questions in the Bible. The rich young ruler asks a great question. But what must I do to be saved? In other words, what must I do for eternal life? And Jesus didn't go, well, I can already see into your life. You're not going to make it. No, he didn't do that. He answered his question. He answered. He answered him. But the answer that was given, the rich young ruler wasn't really interested in that. We, we all know that. You know, I'm thinking that in the church that God has placed, Ephesians 4.11, that says that God has placed in the church, they're under shepherds. They're shepherds of the flock. They're under shepherds, prophets, teachers, pastors for the building up of the church. And you know what? It's okay to ask questions. Did you know that God has placed people around you? There are leaders. There are people like Pastor Jimmy. There are people like Fred and, and George. There are board members. There are people like Pastor Randy. There, there are Sunday school teachers like Chris Baker. There are people that teach grow classes. There, there, there are people that are connect group leaders. And we trust that none of those people are going to make up an answer on the fly when you ask them a difficult question. That if they don't know it, they're going to say, I'm going to pray with you right now, but I'm going to search this out and I'm going to get back to you. But you know that God has placed in the church an incredible opportunity for you to ask questions. Not just to sit and just get, but to ask questions and to grow. You know what I was thinking as I was thinking about this message that God, Sunday school, there are teachers that can help you answer those questions. That setting, it's a perfect place for you to interact and to, and, to, and to learn some things and maybe even be challenged. And to grow classes, the same place, connect groups, same way, man, in those homes where people have demonstrated a spiritual discipline called hospitality. Did you know that was a spiritual discipline? When you open your home to someone and you bring them past the gates, 
In fact, when I was working in, in, on my, in my class, one of my classes I'm in right now is Pentecostal spirituality and discipleship, spiritual formation. We talked about a rule of life. Hospitality is one of those things, I think, from the past, some things, some injuries, some scars. I've got a few T-shirts and a few scars that we may have, I may have, I may have turned the bolt, the deadbolt there. And we can come to the porch, but maybe not in the house. And God dealt with me and said, hey, what are you doing? you got to unlock the door. You see those connect group homes, when you step past the, the, the threshold, they are inviting you into a relationship that helps you grow. And where they will stand with you when you go through terrible things in life. And trust me, you'll have troubles. You won't have to ask for them. They're coming. You'll be challenged today. You'll be challenged. But God has placed people there. So there, not only can he, but he also places others in our life. God's not challenged by your question. Ask away. He's ready to answer you. And he will, if you seek, you will find. He doesn't have a boring, ordinary life. For you. The last thing today is I want to mention that sheep can wander. Those are all caps because there is a good shepherd. I'm shouting it out. Got it? Sheep can wander. I'm going to shout it to you today. There is a good shepherd. There are so many people in the church and outside of the faith that don't realize there's a good shepherd. You can wonder. What does wonder mean here? In fact, the only way I can tell you about wonder here is to mention back from my, back last October, I was in Catalyst, and I began to, uh, you can put that, that up there if you've got it, man. Uh, I was in Catalyst, and, 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 and the, the theme was, real low sound, the theme was, awake the wonder. And you know what? I remember Louis Giglio, who is, uh, who is really instrumental in, uh, in uh, college ministry. His ministry touches over a million college students every year. But I remember about 10 years ago, or 7 or 8 years ago, I was at Catalyst, and he did something that really upset me in the middle of Catalyst. He brought out something and he placed it, he got, went behind the thing and he got it and he set this big bottle there. And he said, this is a cutting edge place. This is Catalyst, this is cutting edge. And he proceeded to talk about the fact that if you participated in what he brought out, you were cutting edge. There are over 5,000 college students sitting in that 10,300 seat uh, crowd. Some of them were my people. They were people from here. And I was thinking, one of the largest, one of the largest problems on the planet in that, in that age group has to do with alcoholism. It has to do with people's lives being messed up because of the, an excess. And you know what? He told that story, and I said, what is wrong with this guy? Fast forward now to last to 2015. Here's Louis Giglio. He's not this I got it all together guy that I've seen in the past. And I'm not sur all, uh, sure what's happened to him. He comes out and he sits on a on a sits on a on a on a seat, doesn't move a lot, gets up some, but doesn't move a lot. And as he does, he begins to tell the story of something that's happened to him in the last couple of years. That he's gone through a dark place. In fact, he's been in such a severe place depression at one point he could not leave his home and in the process of that trying to find his way back out I felt empathy I felt I felt sympathy for him I, I felt I felt as though I had that I was the older brother in the prodigal son story that said ha you didn't give anything to me look at you I'm the guy who's and I felt convicted and I said Lord forgive me and I listened to his story as he told the story of how that he was in this deep depression until God reminded him uh, 
of something that had happened to him earlier on. You saw the, you saw the, uh, the northern lights come up that were there. You saw them come up. He tells the story of going to Alaska to speak. And he was, he was doing a camp or something, and he was in a restaurant. And while he was in the restaurant, he had just got his food. The restaurant had a bunch of people in it. And all of a sudden, people said, somebody comes in the door and says, we got to go. And people start running out of the restaurant. And he's sitting at the table, and he's got his food, and he's like, what is going on here? Even the people at the cash register ran out the door until finally the person that brought him in said, we got to go, we got to go. He said, I just got my food. He said, you don't want to miss this, we got to go. And they jump in the back of a pickup truck, and they run out of town, and they run out to this wilderness kind of where there's not so many lights and stuff. And there they are. There's trees all around. They're kind of an open spot. And there they are. And Louis sitting there and he's thinking to himself, what in the world's going on? <laughs> Come on. What are we doing out here? I'm hungry. And he said, I was sitting there. And, and the people all, all, when he would say something, they'd say, wait for it, man. Just wait for it. Wait for it. All of a sudden, he said, he said, all of a sudden, God said, turn the lights on. And the northern lights, man, begin to go. They begin to move. All of a sudden, man, they begin to, different colors. Things begin to grow in the sky. And he said, all I could do, he said, I was a young man then, but I was just like an old man watching TV. You know what I'm talking about? My wife says I do it all the time. <laughs> honey, 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 what you doing? He said, all I could do, my jaw dropped in wonder because all of a sudden God was so much bigger than I ever imagined he was. He was so much bigger. In fact, he said, in fact, my lava lamp has been going here this morning for a little while. <laughs> Louis said, I knew that God was creative. I knew he was colorful. I knew he is light and he was bright. But he was like a lava lamp to me. He was, he was all contained. I figured him all out until he brought back to my memory in that darkest darkness that I had ever experienced in my life, all of a sudden he said, Louis, don't you remember? I'm the God of the lights. I'm the God of creation. I'm the God who's so created. Louis, I'm still that God. And if you'll let me today, I want to turn the wonderment on in your life. I want you to wonder at who I am. And Louis said, because of that, I let go of God as a lava lamp. He said, I could only see him as this huge, this beautiful, unbelievable, unbelievable phenomenon. And he was, he cared about me. You see, sheep can wonder because there is, there's a good shepherd. There's a good shepherd. You know, in my, when I was in D.C. this past, a couple of weeks ago, in this class, uh, studying all kinds of different things, historical Christianity, uh, studying all kinds of things, things that I've never heard of that many of you probably have, like Lectio Divina, sacred reading, which I, by the way, is a, was a, it's called slow reading, is what the early fathers of the faith called it. And you know what? I, I, I found myself in the middle of this classroom with eight other guys and this professor reading a scripture. And as he read the scripture, he said, look, just be quiet. And just first let's just pray. Ask the Lord just to speak to our lives. This is not like a regular academic class. It didn't, I mean, and you know what? God spoke to me out of that scripture. You know, I found myself, uh, God Working in, my, working in my life while I was there. We took a, a field trip. Yes, even in the master's level, graduate level, uh, students get excited when you get to take a field trip. Yes! Where are we going? National Cathedral. 
medieval architecture, 250 some stained glass windows that were used, by the way, and I didn't realize it, to tell people who couldn't read, illiterate people who couldn't read, which was a lot of people back in history, if you, understand, if you know history, tell them the stories of the Bible. Every stained glass window told a story. I saw tapestries that were 500 years old. One of them was David and Goliath, man. There were, there were like five of them that told the story of David and Goliath. I mean, they're 500 years old. Those things were humongous. They were bigger. They were, they were probably, as big, probably as big as the center screen here, probably 20 feet wide. They were huge things, man. It was unbelievable. And it showed David. It showed David facing Goliath, and it showed David in one scene. You see... Back in the day, man, they believed in telling the whole story to their kids. That was used for kids. They had David carrying the head of the giant through the streets. Oh, I was with, I heard one middle-aged woman behind me. She goes, oh, Lord, that's so violent. Okay. <laughs> I laughed. It made me laugh. I'm sorry. I know that we're not promoting violence, but I understand. I understand where she was coming from, but I also understand that the word of God gets a pass. It gets a pass. You see, when David carried that, that head of that, of that giant, you notice that David, when he killed the Goli uh, Goliath by the Lord's help, he didn't give the head to the king. You notice that, right? You notice that David carried that head through the streets. Through the streets. You know why? Because David knew. David knew there was something next for him that God had planned for his life. He wasn't willing to pass that over to give it to somebody else. He carried that thing. I saw those things. It was unbelievable. We walked through, saw the tour. It was unbelievable, man, looking at all the things. Some of those pictures, man, uh, the National Cathedral, well, you know, you, it, it looks like something out of Batman. Uh, but you know what? Uh, we, we made our way down into uh, underneath of the big, huge uh, uh, facility upstairs or the chapels. This is Chapel of Christmas, you know, they call it, you know, the Incarnation. And then they have all these different chapels where you can go and pray. And finally, there's one called the Chapel of Resurrection. Man, it's so ornate. You can't see it in the picture here. It's me taking the picture. It's dark in there. Everything on the wall back there are mosaic tiles that have been placed there strategically. Artistry like you wouldn't believe. And yet, there are people taking tours. There are school kids there. They're all over the place except for in the chapel of the resurrection, and you have to be quiet there. But they're coming and going, and here we are in a public place. We have our communion. We are praying together. We remember what God has done for us. We participate in something that is so powerful together as brothers in Christ. As we've shared schoolwork and shared all kinds of things for the last 14 months, we now, we are sharing Jesus. And after that, our instructor, which is a young guy, everybody was younger than me, because I'm an old guy now, uh, the instructor said, hey, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to find a place for 30 minutes and just go find a place and pray. Listen to what God says to you. Then I, start, I walk outside of that. I prayed for a few minutes in the chapel of resurrection. I walk out, and man, outside of there, it is so busy. There are people everywhere. There's tours everywhere. Things are going on, and I'm just going, trying to struggle about what to do. I'm trying to hear from God, and it's noisy. And I, I come to this gate. It's open. It's just it's kind of sitting uh, there, and it's a hallway. It didn't, didn't really dawn on me what it was. And I walk past it, and this was the gate to the chapel of the Good Shepherd. I don't know if you can see it by this picture. You can go on and Google it on uh, uh, there and see it at, at National Cathedral. But there are several shepherd staffs that are built into this iron gate. I eventually made my way. I'm looking for the I'm looking for the chapel of the Good Shepherd. You can change that. I'm looking for it, and and I walk into this. It looks like a looks like a looks like a closet, and I walk to there, and it's like chapel of the Good Shepherd. All the other chapels are huge. I mean, man, there are chapels that would be this, this, this big in the basement down there in the crypt level. By the way, like people like Helen Keller are buried in the basement, in, in, the, in the crypt level of the National Cathedral. And they have gates in front. There are some incredible people that are buried there. 
but they're chapels. And I walked through this little thing, and it's just like a doorway to a closet. And I said, this can't be right. And when I get, look through, I see three pews in succession that will seat two people each. And those pews, I walk in and I'm like, and I see this relief that's there of the good shepherd holding the, the little lamb, the sheep. And I really felt like the Lord was saying to me, this is the place for you. This is where I want you to be. I walk in, I'm like, man, if I sit back here, everybody's coming through. And I look around the corner, right up in the front, there's one lone seat. There's six seats here total, two people in each pew, and one little seat, and I sit up there. And when I did, I really was sitting there, and I just was saying, Lord, thank you so much for, for loving me. Thank you for so much for caring for me. And I, I said, you know, we've been, we've heard a lot about a man by the name of Eugene Peterson. Anybody know what the Message Bible is? He was the, the man that, that spearheaded that, but he's also an incredible guy, an incredible uh, writer, theologian, all kind, just an incredible guy. And so I turned to Psalms 23 in my, in my, on my phone in, in the message, and it says this, God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. This is the part that jumped off the page to me. True to your word, you let me catch my breath. And you send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid when you walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook make me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. Every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. And you know what? You say, well, pastor, why did I speak to you? I'll go to class in the morning. Go back, ride the metro back to my hotel. Read five hours. Ride five hours. <laughs> My mind. In fact, what the Lord spoke to me in that classroom setting was, shh, be quiet for a second. You fill in your head with so many things. You filled your mind with so many things to speak to me that I cannot speak to you. So just shh, take a breath. Be quiet. I want to speak to you. I have direction for you. And you know what? When I sat there, the more I sat, the more I wept. Here I'm in, a, I'm in a public place. And yet the Holy Spirit just shows up. You know what? He said to me, I wrote it down. If you will quiet yourself before me and breathe, I'll send you in the right direction. You'll hear me speak and be comforted. I am your shepherd. The kind that is willing to come to you in the brambles of life. In the mire of your questions and unbelief. I am your shepherd. I don't know about you today. You see the hands? One of the things that I noticed while I was sitting there was the hands were so dirty. They were so oil laden. Now I'm sure that there have been people that have come in there and prayed there. Hopefully they didn't pray to that. I don't know. I didn't pray to that, that piece of rock. I prayed to the living shepherd today. But it reminded me, that image reminded me when I saw it, my shepherd was willing to get dirty for me. He was willing to leave the splendors of heaven to come for me. He was willing to find me when I was hung up in the brambles, in the thickets, in the, in the thorns of this life. He's even willing to come and speak to me when I'm mired in the questions that I have about life and even about him. He's my shepherd today. He's willing to do that for me. You know what? I was thinking, when you're looking at sheep can, sheep can wonder. 
there's a good shepherd. Do you have the picture of the ram? Do you have the picture of the... I want you to see this because this reminds me of the picture that I think maybe more accurately expresses how God sees his sheep. Not all pinned up. Not you can't have any fun. Not you can't experience any life. Not you can't, you can't, you can't. But man, let me turn, let me show you what I have in store for you. I want you to know I'm about to put in your view the greenest pastures you've ever seen. Lay down for a second and just take a breath. Quit struggling so much. I'm there with you to help you. I want you to look at the view. You know, I've never been to Alaska. Maybe I'll get a chance to go one day. They tell me that the views are spectacular. I have stood up on the top of a few volcanoes in Central America and South America. But you know what? I think the view that God has in store for you and me as a sheep is incredible. Do you hear me today? You see, you can wonder. You can be caught up in the wonder of the shepherd today because he is so incredible. He's so unbelievable. I want to ask you a question. When was the last time you were caught up by the view of God in his wonderment? When was the last time you quieted your mind and your body just to listen to his voice? Where are you today? Are you wandering? Moving around? Can't get your mind in, in gear? Are you wandering? Lord, I just don't know. Or are you wandering? That's the good shepherd. And not just the good shepherd. That's my good shepherd. That's my shepherd. He's the one who cares for me. Where are you at today? In fact, I want to ask you, I want to incorporate, I want to encourage you to do something this morning. You see, when you get caught up in the wonder of who God is, it will change who you are as his sheep. You know what? When we have our eyes on Jesus, here's what sheep don't do. They don't bite each other. When they're caught up with the Savior. How many of you I just said? They don't kick their shepherd when they're caught up. You know why? They go, whoo. You saw on the video that we watched earlier when the shepherd was calling the sheep, they knew his voice. Then he was ready to feed them. And they couldn't, they were, couldn't wait, man. You know what? They weren't trying to hurt him. They weren't trying to do. They weren't even putting something on him. They were saying, that's the shepherd. He has my good in view. You see, that's the God that we serve. When sheep are caught up in the wonderment, here's the one, one of the biggest things that will happen to them. They will begin to notice other sheep who are in the other two categories. They will see the sheep that are people on this planet that don't know Jesus yet. Now, I know I'm digressing from the metaphor here, but they will notice the people that are not, they're not in the faith. And they'll see them as people who God knows their voice, created them, and wants to have an incredible relationship with them. And they'll see it as their job to show them that there's a savior, there's a shepherd who actually loves them and was willing to get his hands dirty. There may be others who are in the faith and they have questions. They'll start noticing them and they'll start trying to be, they'll start trying, they'll ask the Holy Spirit, how can I help? How can I help this person to get where they need to be? Most of all, though, they'll still. Whether they're wondering, whether you've wondered today, whether you are wondering with questions, or whether you are here and you say, I just want to be caught up in God's presence, there is a good shepherd. Here's what I'd like for you to do. I'm going to play a song. The band is coming back up, and they're going to, uh, they're going to worship with you this morning for a, few, for a couple of minutes. But I want you to put that song on right now. Do it, would you? And I want you to just look for the image. Just, just a song, David Crowder, Come Thou Fount. The one that says we're prone to wonder. Maybe you see yourself in here. Why don't you just be real quiet? Don't think about anything else. Maybe you won't see yourself in these images, but if you do, just ask the Lord to speak to you. Would you do that today as we worship God together?